Well, hello there. It's quite a pleasure. Continuing from our previous session, our most distinguished guest has a question. Yes. You mentioned that Alan Callahan said that the Gospels, if you want to read the Gospels as eyewitness accounts, historical records, and so on, then not only are we in for some tough going, I think there's evidence within the material itself that it's not intended to be read that way. They don't claim to be eyewitness accounts of his life. But John was written by an eyewitness. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things. We know that his testimony is true. This is true. There is a claim and we can further look into this claim. For one, Mark and Matthew do not claim to be eyewitness accounts. Luke, as well, separates himself. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, even as they delivered them unto us, there is something noticeable in the candor with which the writer disclaims the character of an eyewitness. So that leaves us with the gospel according to John. Now, who is the author of John? John. The beloved disciple, five works in the current day Bible are attributed to John. Of these five books, the only one that explicitly identifies its author as a John is Revelation. Modern scholarship generally rejects the idea that this work is written by the same author as the other four documents. The other four documents. The authorship of the Gospel of John, the fourth gospel, is widely contested. Scholars have debated the authorship of Johannine literature since at least the 3rd century, but especially since the Enlightenment. Not the Apostle John? Most scholars conclude that the Apostle John, son of Zebedee, wrote none of the Johannine works, including the Gospel of John. That is therefore sometimes referred to the 4th Gospel, in order to disassociate John from it. Various objections to John, the Apostle's authorship, have been raised. The Synoptic Gospels are united in identifying John as a fisherman from Galilee, and Acts 4.13 refers to John as without learning or unlettered. The fourth Gospel is written by someone who, based on their style and knowledge of the Greek language and grammar, would have to have been well educated in Greek. On the other hand, as an uneducated, illiterate Galilean fisherman, John the Apostle would most likely have had Aramaic as his native language and no knowledge of any other, other language. He's a fisherman, you know. Let alone the ability to write in the sophisticated Greek of the fourth gospel. In the sophisticated Greek of the fourth gospel. The fourth gospel emphasizes Judea and the author seems to have had an advanced knowledge of Judean topography, so likely came from there. On the other hand, John the Apostle came from Galilee, came from Galilee. The fourth gospel is a highly intellectual account of Jesus' life and is familiar with the rabbinic traditions of biblical interpretation. At any rate, the claim would make John the only gospel of the canonical four to claim not only to be based on eyewitness accounts, but to have been actually written by an eyewitness. So, who was this beloved disciple, the inferred eyewitness? Well, there are holes, and many hypotheses have been put forward. This disciple, unknown from the synoptics, unknown from the synoptics, is depicted as an intimate companion of Jesus through the climactic final events of his life. He reclines beside Jesus through the farewell discourse. He is the only male disciple to stand beside Jesus at the crucifixion. To stand beside Jesus at the crucifixion. And he is the first to believe in the empty tomb. He is unattested in other early sources. Every synoptic parallel that could corroborate his presence at a given moment in Jesus' life does not. Not the synoptic crucifixion scenes, nor Luke's description of Peter's visit to the tomb. So, the case that most of these scholars present is as follows. This figure was invented by the author of John as an authenticating device for his gospel and was later co-opted by the authors of the epistles in support of other agendas. 
You see, false authorial claims are present and apparent all throughout the New Testament. The term is called pseudepigraphon, a text that misrepresents its author's identity, whether or not it names its implied author. Readers are welcome to substitute other terms as desired, for instance, fake or imposter, forgery. New Testament scholar Bert Ehrman stated, Arguably, the most distinctive feature of the early Christian literature is the degree to which it was forged. An example of pseudepigrapha are the disputed Paulines. And as David Litwa, in his article, Literary Eyewitnesses, The Appeal to an Eyewitness in John and Contemporaneous Literature, writes, The similarities between John's eyewitness and those found in ancient pseudepigrapha force the critical reader to reflect on why scholars even today argue strongly for the historicity of the beloved disciple, while easily discounting the historicity of similar eyewitness claims. Ancient pseudepigrapha also read their eyewitnesses into narrative as idealized characters, as idealized characters, thereby establishing their trustworthiness. Andrew Lincoln, in Aspects of History in the Fourth Gospel, says, A large percentage of the text is of suspect historicity, including entire discourses. Is of suspect historicity, including entire discourses, whose style, tone, and contents differ so radically from the sayings of Jesus preserved in Paul and the synoptics as to indicate creativity on a large scale. Translation, you made this up, dude. In the book Anatomy of the Fourth Gospel, a study in literary design, Alan Culpepper states that these discourses are the author's fabrications is clear. It's clear from the fact that when Jesus, the literary character, mm, that's... I don't know about the literary part, but go on, speaks, he speaks the language of the author and his narrator. In certain passages, it is impossible to tell when Jesus stops speaking and when or if the narrator speaks, most notably 3, 13 through 21, 31 through 36. Different style speech. Different style speech? Not the words of Jesus? Jesus? In short, Jesus' voice has been commandeered by the author, who makes him the mouthpiece of an intricate system of ideas foreign to the synoptics. Foreign to the synoptics. What is that? Including the need to be born from above, abide in God, walk in the light. Okay, so the Gospel of John is different from the rest. Brett Snyder called into question the apostolic authorship of the gospel and even stated that on the basis of the author's unsteady grip of topography, the author could not have come from Palestine. He argued that the meaning and nature of Jesus presented in the Gospel of John was very different from that in the Synoptic Gospels. Was very different from that in the Synoptic Gospels. And thus, its author could not have been an eyewitness to the events. Brett Snyder cited an apologetic character in John, indicating a later date of composition. Scholars such as Wellhausen, Went, and Spitta have argued that the fourth gospel is a grunshift, or a work which had suffered interpolation before arriving at its canonical form. There is much uniqueness to the Johannine literature from language, style, etc. But back to the question of being an eyewitness account. The proposition is that the ideas and teachings in John are new, and to lend his views greater credibility, our author adopted a strategy familiar from the Gospels of Thomas and Mary. He constructed a narrative in which Jesus himself articulates his views. Articulates his views. Embellishment, a detail especially one that is not true, added to a statement or story to make it more interesting or entertaining is compatible with eyewitness testimony. But fabrication of the scope and kind seen in John, hundreds of verses of, of invented discourse material, amounting to a systematic refiguration of Jesus' teachings, is another matter altogether. This kind of refiguration evokes Gospels like Thomas and Mary, text that extensively colonizes Jesus' voice to introduce novel theologies. Wait, wait, 
He's saying that the teachings and ideas found in John are so foreign and different that it's like the Gospel of Thomas and Mary. Ouch. Gospel of Thomas and Mary? Gospel of Thomas and Mary? Yeah, they were left out because the contents didn't conform to Christian doctrine. As most ancient Christian texts have been lost, this discovery was exceptional. The discovery includes the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, and the Acts of Peter. None of these texts were included in the Bible because the content didn't conform to Christian doctrine, and they're referred to as apocrypha. The New Testament apocrypha are a number of writings by early Christians that give accounts of Jesus and his teachings, the nature of God, or the teachings of his apostles, and of their lives. Some of these writings have been cited as scripture by early Christians. But since the 5th century, a widespread consensus has emerged limiting the New Testament to the 27 books of the modern canon. Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant churches generally do not view these New Testament apocrypha as part of the Bible. So, they argue that the whole eyewitness testimony thing used in John is also used in other rejected Gospels, and that it's a common tactic used in writings that contain new and questionable content. Questionable content. Tellingly, Thomas also claims eyewitness credibility. So too does the Gospel of Peter. Introducing an eyewitness was a standard historiographical convention in antiquity, used to authenticate revisionary works that otherwise might have been questioned for their novelty in form and content. For this reason, first-person speech and eyewitness accounts are encountered frequently in literary forgeries, so much so as to be virtually characteristic of them. John's eyewitness claim may serve to authenticate its own fabrications. Its own fabrications. So you see what a good many modern New Testament scholars say regarding the Gospel of John and it being authored by an eyewitness. And it being authored by an eyewitness. Not just the Gospel of John, but the epistles of John as well. Third John takes a different tack by assuming the guise of a personal letter to a named recipient, a strategy with distinct benefits for a pseudographer. A personal letter is difficult to falsify. Since the text's invented author is fabricated, however, the names in the letter are probably a tease. We are no more likely to find Third John's Gaius or Demetrius than Second Timothy's Carpus, or let alone the coat in Carpus's possession. That's harsh, but you gotta remember, there were a lot of forgeries, and there are many gospels and epistles that have been assigned the label fraud. That have been assigned the label fraud. The label fraud. Now then, this is what we suppose Mr. Callahan and other New Testament scholars the likes of him mean when they say that the gospels are in eyewitness accounts. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all what we have for you today.